you know, hopefully tonight we're going to talk about things um, that are relevant to, to today. Um, these are, you know, really experienced managers. I'm old. I've been around a long time. So uh, we're going to try to take it up to like the current issues. Um, and that's why it says music uh, management today. The, um, I think management um, has a lot in common and, uh, with the old days as well. I mean, one of my mentors many years ago in explaining the music business to me said, it's a very simple business. You find great artists, you let them make great music, and you figure out a way for people to hear it and see it. And basically, that's still the business. Um, and in doing that, to me, having been a lawyer for over 36 years, the most important characters in the business are always the managers. They are the ones that do that. And um, you know, as a lawyer, great managers have only ever made, made me look good. Um, bad managers, different story. So, um, so we, we've got a few topics that we're tr trying to talk about tonight and have some kind of engaged conversation. We're supposed to only have 15 minutes for Q&A. If it gets pretty slow, maybe we'll change it up and, uh, and engage you guys sooner. Um, the first category that I think we need to talk about, um, I've called, do you need a record label? Um, we live in a time now where it's, um, it's a streaming, social media, data-rich business. And we see a lot of stories of people that are bypassing the traditional system. <laughs> and I think managers are on that front line of that question. Um, and I'd like to throw it to, start with Kevin, who has lived on both sides of that conversation, and see, how do you feel about that one, Kevin? Uh, I think uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, depends on what your artist needs. It's not. It, like to me, I think we're resources. You know, what I mean, we're we're not we're not there to say, like the label thing. I think it's it's played out. Like, and I'm, I'm saying because I have a label too, but I'm saying if we're really a resource in the platform. You know, if you want to be a global artist, you need more resources. If you want to call it a label, you want to call it financing, you want to call it marketing, call it whatever you want. But I believe if you want to be a global artist, you know, you need additional help. So I think um, there's only a very few that can do it globally without, you know, and even some, the ones that do it without, they're not global, global. You know, global, I mean, you, you can tour in Puerto Rico, tour in Japan, some artists never even been there before, and they're, they're big artists, you know what I mean? But they're not um, global superstars, I think. So if you, if you have a global superstar, you need additional help. If you have a niche artist, and maybe only cater to certain people, you can probably do it, you know, by yourself, you know, but I, I find with cheat codes, uh, I can't do by myself. You know, I need additional help around the world. You know, a, a smaller artist, um, let's say a, a, a Kay Michelle, she signed to Atlantic. Um, it's good that she signed to Atlantic because they give her more resources to time from TV to you know doing records. So I believe you need uh, all of the above. I don't think it's one one way for um, an artist right right now. Um. I think that's where, you know, are, are we in a state of transition there? Y yes, so there's money. There are certain genres like pop music where you need to go to the traditional um, media sources. But say, Andrew, you live in the world of, uh, of a culture of electronic music and, um, you know, basically the music gets put out and it's gone global. How, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Kevin that it depends on the artist. I think we've seen that it, we've always viewed a record label at, at its core definition of like a group of people who are there to exploit your master recordings. And that takes access, it takes revenue, it takes infrastructure. So if you have the ability to provide infrastructure and revenue to work those things without a traditional record label, then I don't think you need one. We didn't have one for Major Lazer in North America. We had infrastructure, we had revenue, but we did have one internationally. Right? We work with Because Music in Europe because I don't know how to break a record in Benelux as well as Emmanuel at Because. So I don't think it's a simple yes or no question. I think you know we set out to prove that you could do it by yourself 
and do it big. You know, we went to number one with Lean On on our own independently in North America to prove that it's not just about being a niche artist. And a lot of that is driven by the fact that we came out of a community that supports itself, right? There's 150,000 people at EDC, Coachella, Lollapalooza, any of the above festivals that are playing each other's music and remixing each other's music and the same thing exists on the internet. And I think that has provided us with the ability to be more independent and not have to be part of a big corporation where you have to get in line for radio dates and things like that. And I think that takes money, frankly, like to hire radio staff. I mean, to work a record to top 40 radio probably costs a minimum of 150 grand. So I think it just depends on the artist in the same way that I'm sure if you're a major pop star that requires, you know, you need to learn to dance and learn to dress and learn how to cut your hair, you probably need a record label. I don't think that goes for everybody anymore in the way that it used to, though. Did, so how did you do it with Lean On? I'm curious how you got past some of those barriers. If so we, we, we did a few things. One is we kind of took the international conversation and partnered with someone who knew what they were doing. And while everyone was out there kind of fighting with Spotify or deciding whether or not they like Spotify, we really leaned into the Spotify conversation um, in a way that affected, like it kind of broke down any kind of country barriers for the music. So it started breaking market by market, right? It broke in the Nordics, then it broke in France, then it broke in the UK. And by the time we took it to radio in North America, I mean, I don't remember the exact number, but it was significantly, it was in the top 10 global chart on Spotify. So in the kind of traditional radio promo game of have some hard facts to pitch to these guys, that was the fact. On top of the fact that the band was worth 10,000 tickets in every major market in America, was already a festival headliner. So we had a lot of analytics to build upon. And we went and we hired Michael Lieberman, who's like a big independent radio guy who I'm sure you guys use, you know, and everybody here knows, um, who started the project. And then when the time came, Mike brought in Dale Canone and the Intune guys who caught our attention when they worked the Lumineers independently and did pretty well in the red system. So we're like constantly building upon the team as the, the needs kind of demanded it. Um, and it was a hybrid because we did it by ourselves here and we, we worked with a company called M Theory who provided product managers and things like that to the, to the table. So we, we put together a conglomerate of people to break it. Um, and I think it is largely due to understanding how Spotify worked at the time and like using Spotify and like someone said to me that, oh, like you guys proved you could break a band on Spotify globally in the way that like Grey's Anatomy proved that you could break the fray, like some hot AC record through music licensing. So I think we kind of set that standard and I think a lot of people do it now. Like you see people working these playlists at Spotify like they're, they're program directors, right? There's like 75 editors, I think, at Spotify now. Well, you know, one, uh, mentioning that, um, and one of the reasons I'm skeptical about how much you might need a, at least a traditional major label system anymore is when you talk to people at major labels, all they talk about is spot, getting on a Spotify playlists because that is the, the way that they're looking to break people first and foremost. And um, I don't know if it applies for a legacy artist like Duran Duran or for people coming out of certain, some of your, uh, the genres you operate in, in, in Michael. Um, I mean, is, is that a focus of? I, I think the, they're in, in the traditional major label system, they're, those are corporations. And so there, ha there, there have to be tangible goals. It used to be get on MTV or VH1. It used to be get on Z100. And now the tangible, sort of rateable, gaugeable um, goal is a Spotify playlist. And then there's a variety of those playlists. Some are more important than others. And so I, I think for some of it, a lot of it is just how you can report back to your boss. I, I got him on this playlist. So, and it's, you know, whereas I think in management, what what we are, we we are we look at at the career holistically. So we're Spotify is definitely no doubt a part of it, but we've also got a lot of other things that we have to keep an eye on, and we also have we know our artists best, and so we know that this might not start at Spotify, you know, or this might this really does need to start start at Spotify before anyone's going to pay attention. And so I think, you know, in any, in any corporate structure, you're going to get corporate um, grading, grading systems or, you know, corporate reporting. 
And I think that's just the most tangible thing right now, is that Spotify is, you know, being on the, the right playlist at Spotify is the end all be all. But we also know that it doesn't matter. If, if the song's not a hit, it can be at the top, you know, it's not a hit. And, and, and that's what Spotify, I think, is, is the double-edged sword right now, is that if a song is not a hit, you can't go to radio and lie and say, no, 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 it's really a hit. And they say, no, look at the top 40 markets across the, the country. It's not a hit. The, da the upside is, is that it gets things out of the way faster and gets more, you know, gives more people the opportunity to get a, get a slot. The downside is you can't fake a story like you used to be able to. So do you think that the, the Spotify playlist has become sort of the one-trick pony of the label system the way getting on, getting on radio has been? Um, when I look back at some of the great successes I've seen managers pull off in my career, generally, whether it was in hip-hop or in jam bands or um, electronic music, it's been about identifying the community around that artist and building that authentic community up. And maybe, you know, John, uh, about, you know, whether it's mixtapes in the 90s that were just th distributed on the streets in hip hop, or John Mayer being on the right compilation, Americana compilation, hitting the right audience, or Dave Matthews growing a club, you know, from club to club, uh, bigger venues. I mean, uh, let's speak about what's really involved with management, which is really, I think, building the community uh, that this artist has, you know. It's all related, reason. obviously, and I think the one thing that you're getting as an answer across here is like, well, it depends on the artist and it depends on the music and it. Like, I think the trick is to have that flexibility and, as Michael said, to kind of identify what's most important for your artist. Um, I think pretty much at the moment across the board, getting on the right playlist on Spotify is very few people that are gonna be like, no, I don't want that. I don't get on the, on the good playlist. Um, so, and I think, you know, the idea of a mixtape, forget about that, There's that, that's not even an idea anymore. Uh, I'm not even sure what a mixtape, like sometimes people put things out, I'm like, is this a mixtape or an album? We, we don't, it's just a project now. Um, but the rap caviar of Spotify and hip hop is, it's the most important playlist you can be on, and you will pretty quickly know if you have a record that's resonating with fans of that particular genre of music. So it's not a little bit unfair to call a one-trick pony, I think. Um, I think it's just something that everyone's talking and focused on because, sadly, 18 months ago, nobody even thought about this idea at a record label, and they were still stuck in the old paradigm. So. You, you kind of have to figure out how to take that and then take that information and that data, that real-time information, like, hey, even, so, even though we have this rap caviar thing or we have this other you know, hip-hop playlist um, or this other rock playlist, in particular, for whatever reason, in Houston, a lot of people are listening to that. Let's go work that market. Let's go to that radio station and say, hey, we have a little bit of a story here. Let's go to the, a promoter locally there. So. I, the value of that real-time data, I think, is the most interesting and important piece of what's happening in music today. And that's, to your point, also global, right? So, hey, for whatever reason, this record really works in Sweden. Um, maybe it's a bigger record than we thought. So it, it, it is, it's just taking the information and digesting it quickly. I, I think also, just to add to that, I think that... Um, you know, some of what we're talking about is is current artists coming up. I think for me, with a band like Duran Duran and and with Aerosmith, when I was working with them, the challenge is how do you get the new music? You know, I I look at our Spotify things for Duran, and it's all Ordinary World on a playlist, or and it's as challenging to get the new music on the playlist as it was to get it on Z100. So it's a, you know, it, it so much depends on what stage they're at in their career. It's, it's a great resource to be able to see, as you said, you know, like why is, why is South America such a big market suddenly and what can we do to sort of, you know, micro market to that. But, it, but the same challenges, you know, it's very different depending on at what stage people are at in their career, I think. The, um the streaming services, their playlists, are they much more open than the restricted playlists that we started seeing at radio formats? Or are they, 
Is it political? Is it tough to get on? It's become the game now um, in terms of getting people to hear it. Um, you know, and then trying to go to radio from then, or do, can you go to radio and then, you know, does it matter getting on a... I, I, I mean, I got a real-time example. Maggie Linderman, Pretty Girls. We thought we had a great radio record. I said thought. $100,000 $100, later, we realized we didn't have a great radio record. But she has 2 million followers. So I'm like, how do I get to that community? How do we migrate them from here to Spotify? Then we did a remix. They put, they actually Spotify put the original version in top playlists and it didn't come back. Then Chico's did a remix of the record, <coughs> 500, 9,000 consumption, 12,000, now we're doing 20,000 consumption based off of the remix. But 60% of those sales are coming outside of the US. So I know I need a partner now to do a pop record around the world, so to me, I think you have to look at sh streaming these as like the new street, you know, the new, and they do have communities. Rap Caviar is not just a playlist, it's a community of people. Well, it's a mixtape. Yeah, right. yeah, it's a mixtape. <laughs> right. So you have to, to me, you have to cater to it, because I could have gave up. When it didn't work at radio, I could have gave up. But then you got this thing called Musical.ly, and people started doing, singing a record, and I'm now getting calls from all kinds of international um, labels saying, hey, can we license this record? When, when we first put it out, everybody said, well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But that's the beauty of it now. Now they're calling me. And now they're begging me, can we license this record around? Or Chico's did a billion streams, only on Spotify. Never played anywhere else, no radio or anything. So we said, how can we take that and migrate it? Okay, we put Demi Lovato on the record. We know she has a 56 million following on Instagram. She has pop thing, and now the record's exploding uh, around the world. So I, I think if you think you can get away from streaming and do it without streaming, I, I just think, I, I don't know what, which artist does it, from Kendrick to um, Chico. I think, to me, it's all about streaming to me. So I, think, I think you gotta consider the way that people specifically like youth culture consumes music now too. I think that's the most important thing because I grew up like when these guys were running Def Jam and Rockefeller or whatever and we always like paid attention to like what the DJ Clue mixtape was or whatever and like my understanding of it was that the mixtape song would then pop in the club and then it would go on Hot 97 and then it would get big nationally and then internationally, right? And I don't think it's that different. It's kind of like applied learning to the current state of affairs because kids aren't buying mixtapes anymore kids are on Spotify and Pandora and Apple Music. And I think it's more about engaging those people in the way that they want to listen to music. Because now when we have a song leak, I have artists go, my song leaked. I'm like, don't worry about it. Why not? We can't, the song can't leak on Spotify, Apple Music. Who has an MP3 player anymore? Don't worry about it, right? <laughs> Good. And, right. and like, they just, now it works in a way that I think, like for me with electronic music and witnessing what happened with electronic music is that, like, the barrier to entry for making hip hop and electronic music, the cost of entry went down. So everyone started making music at, at their houses, right? Then the way that they can release and distribute music became a lot easier. And then the live world kind of led the way for paying these people enough money to build home studios or go on tour on their own. So you had an act like Diplo, who owns his own record label, Matt Deason, who owns his own festival with Matt Deason Block Party, who owns his own publishing company, who is like working with MIA and working with Beyonce and working with Usher all before Lean On, right? So he's like a household name because he was able to work those angles in the way that young people consume music so that before he even, like the research is always the key thing, right? Like the song's got X amount of plays, he's worth X amount of tickets, but when we take a song to radio now, we're taking a, like a global superstar song to radio who's never had a song on radio, which I think was a very new concept. But it was, it's always about understanding the way that a kid is consuming music. And I've always viewed the hard ticket thing as a way bigger barometer, especially now, because I think it's way harder to get someone to spend 50 bucks and give up their Friday night with you than to listen to a song 10 times on Spotify. It seems like a very passive experience to me, where a real fan buys the t-shirt and goes to the show and knows everything about the band, which is, to John's point of like, it's not about like how we're exploiting the recorded music. It's about like how it plays into everything else. Um, I don't even remember what the initial question was, but just, I don't well, know. I, I think do I. one of the things, though, because you were talking about, do you need a record company, right? Well, so, that's the question. Um, yes. You know, right. Diplo, as much as at that moment in time that was a unique thing, but Diplo was 
certainly in a music business, a household name. Sure. Um, and when we talk, you know, Duran Duran, like, there are ways to do this without a record company when you have, he's had a lot of resources. They have a lot of, they have worldwide fans. I think the interesting question is, does a new artist need a record company? And the answer is, they need a partner without question. And then what does that partnership look like? And up until now, and maybe this will continue because most artists are more concerned about being famous than what their deal looks like and what they've entered, you know, the agreement they've entered into until they have success and then they call their lawyer and say, how did you let me sign this? <laughs> um, is, you know, what, what, how do we, how does that change? Does this become more like investment banking? I mean, that's a terrible word to use around creativity, but is it more of an investment in a band or an artist and the 360 rights are genuinely earned. And is there an arrangement where, one of the things that we still don't get, we get what we call data from Spotify. We don't get real data from Spotify. We get like, oh, it got played in Houston. We don't know who played it, how much money they make, you know, and not all of that information. Spotify has that information without question. And Labels probably are getting that information. I don't. The, uh, Google has that information. Yes. Facebook has that information. So, how do we That's a real get question. that information for artists, right? How do we get past that barrier? Because those super fans then become very identifiable for us. And then we can super serve our super fans who then tell their friends and, and they tell their friends and so on and so forth. So, I think the question is what does a record label look like going forward? Because you need one, you need a partner. And then what do those arrangements look like? Who owns the masters? Where is the data information? Who's sharing it? Who's benefiting from it? And I think those are the interesting questions that are coming up in today's world. We did a, a project about, oh, I don't know, five, six years ago maybe with Duran Duran where they were getting ready to make an album. They had got maybe seven or eight tracks. We'd invited Robert Kondrick from Apple to come down to the studio just as, you know, just come down and hear what they've been doing. And by the time he left that night, he brought a couple of other people down with him. He'd managed to convince them that we didn't need a label. We were getting ready to start shopping a deal. And he said, no, 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 I've got the biggest shop window in the world. I'm gonna give you that shop window for Christmas, for the Christmas of whatever that year was. Um, and we are going to just, you know, show everybody the power of, of Apple. We won't do, we, you won't even do, need to do much marketing beforehand. So we did a couple of things beforehand, but it was really the idea of dropping a sort of, almost like a surprise album. And what we learned, and, and I mean, everybody went into it knowing the risks. And, and what we learned was, A, at the time, most of our fans, it was early, so most of our fans weren't even probably on Apple at the time. They were still buying physical CDs. Um, we, they did give us unprecedented support, but, but a lot of the functions that you need around the marketing of a record, they, they weren't able to provide. And so I think, you know, it, it really, you, st you need the same, you know, as to your point about what kind of partner do you need, it doesn't necessarily need to take the, the form of a label, but you do need warm bodies to do things, you need money to market stuff, and, and you need to know who it is that you're trying to reach, which, uh, you know, I was saying to somebody earlier, it's always surprising to me how in, the, in this business when, you know, there's billions of dollars at stake and there's very little for managers, more now, but, but relatively little information about who your customers are. You look at who shows up to the shows and you go, okay, well, I think they're mostly women between this age and this age. But you don't really know, to John's point, you don't know how much they earn, you don't know half the time when they're buying tickets, you don't even know where they live. And um, I think the more information we can get around that, the, the better job we can do to market to those people. So, so and I think that's just, I think that's where we're, that certainly is a, where we're headed is we're, we're gonna uh, invest heavily in the data collection business and, and you know, building in our own infrastructure um, to collect that data, analyze that data so that we're not reliant on people, because once we have our customer, we know, you know, then, then we can start the relationship with them. And I think if you ask most, most music fans, they would rather have a direct dialogue with their artists or artist management company and they then go via Spotify or Twitter or, you know, or any of the but, other. But Michael, isn't it just, isn't it also about, yeah, knowing who the super fan is, knowing all the information about them and who the potential fans is, but, but are, but also isn't being a manager also about how do you 
bring the fans that don't know their fans yet to become fans. And that's the data that Google has or Facebook right. has ab about everything from age to geography to what, what websites people are searching or what they're buying that, you know, because, you know, you want it, to, it's, the goal is to reach, build this community to the biggest, reach the most amount of people for your artists. That's all they want. They want to reach their music and their, you know, impact to be as big as it can be. And um, I want to talk about, I want to have you focus on that. I think it's, 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 it is the issue for the next five years. I, I have a question. So are you thinking of that as a one-on-one -on -one destination for each artist? Like, I think that's a part of the challenge, right? When, if we can't get the, and, and I, that's, that's something I want to fight for more and more, it's like, People live on Spotify and Apple Music and I guess on iTunes and some people I guess buy CDs and some people buy vinyl, but it, it, I think it's much more difficult even as a super fan to get them to go to your website to experience the music or to go to your website to buy the tickets. They want to have a very close relationship with you and feel in touch with you and mainly do that through social media today, but they don't want to have to like get off Spotify to go listen to the Lumineers album. They want to be able to have that totally. seamlessly inside totally. there. No, I, I, my goal is to have, is to be able to, to find them and not, not rely on them finding us. And so I, it, it's a very, for us, it's an outgoing relationship that we're, I just want to know where they are so that when I need them, or, uh, that I know where to go to find them. And that doesn't mean bringing them to our site. I think that means meeting them in their environment but knowing where they are in that, knowing where that environment is. So how are you doing that, Michael? Well, it's by, no, I mean, it's by doing, I mean, we're investing heavily in, in, a, in a digital department and we're bringing in, you know, I, I'm hiring people from presidential campaigns, literally, who have never been in the music business before. Um, because I think a lot, of, a lot of times in any industry, innovation comes from outside our business. And, the music business so far hasn't done a great job of navigating digital. And so, you know, I, we're all smart people up here and we all have probably an advantage over a lot of people, but I think bringing in other people who can look at a situation and say, well, this is insane. Why would you ever do it this way when you can do it this way? We just had never thought about it doing it that way. And I think, you know, you, Andrew, I think what you did with Diplo definitely made people look at it differently and think, wow, I, I mean, that, that is the fir I have always said that no, no artist has ever broken worldwide without a major label. And you were the first, and that, that's Radiohead with the tip jar, that's Pearl Jam with, you know, uh, you know, with going, doing a, an exclusive, and you did it. And I think that's what's, but that, that came by thinking differently and outside of the, probably the music paradigm of, you know, well, we at least, we'll just do a distribution deal or we'll just do a licensing deal or we'll just hire their promo department. You know, um, I, and, and so I, I think that's, you've, you've broken it down and sort of broken the mold in terms of, and shown what can happen. It's interesting because you're making me think about though, that like I guess the one reason why we would, anyone would ever consider signing to a big label in the future from my perspective is if they had access to that information that they were gonna share. Like right. if they were one stop, so if you didn't have to go out and build or go through the painstaking process of building a staff and teaching them about the fundamentals of the recorded music industry and then teach them how to share the data or the kind of data you were looking for, if that was already provided, that would be more valuable than a radio department, in my opinion. It, well, that's, and that's, like, it's interesting that, like, to me, like, the entire economics of the record business has changed, but the record deal hasn't. Like, right. what you pay and right. what you get for it is the same, right. but now everything is different in terms of how the money has changed hands and how people experience if, music. If you have You're that also assuming data, that they're hiring people that'll get that information. Right. I'm not even sure they're getting sure, well, I don't they think they're getting, getting out of the data. I don't think they're getting it, but if you have that information, doesn't marketing and distribution become the same thing? You are literally targeting the, pe the audience that needs to be marketed to and who are going to consume it. Yeah, and that's, that's, uh, we, we got that value out of owning a traveling festival. You know, we owned a, a, the block party at its height did 280,000 tickets, right? That's 280,000 names, emails, addresses, age, ages. You know, it's the most specific demographic we've ever gotten access to for our fan base. And if there was a way to gain that from 
Spotify and Facebook, it would be game changing. I just, it's almost like conspiracy theory ish that the labels have it, and we don't know that though. Right. Well, let's just switch it a little bit here for a second. Um, the um, I'm gonna say that's not a theory. <laughs> well, Kevin's gonna be quiet about that. Um, Do you have it, Kevin? I plead the fifth. <laughs> No, it was, but honestly, one of the reasons we, we uh, got Google as a, a, our biggest investor is because we felt that the YouTube and Google data was very important. So I, I'm not going to say that I have all the information, but I have access to enough to know and enough. Like I, I'm working the uh, head of uh, directive economics at Spotify because I want to understand what he's looking at. And so to me, it's just about not just working a playlist person, you have to work the whole building. You really have to figure out, you know, what, it, like Melanie Martinez signed to Atlantic, she just catered to her fans. You know, all she did was catered to her fans, catered to her fans, and it continued to blow, and she was doing 2,000, 3,000 seats, but she catered to her fans, you know, and to me, I think, you know, with, you know, I can only say with, 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 with Maggie, she had two million people. They were just on Twitter and Instagram. Then they were um, some, some millions on Musical.ly. And so we just had to, I call it um, social migration. You just have to get them, because they are on Spotify too, but they don't know her from, from that. So you have to just make sure um, you get in and don't just talk to the playlist people. I mean, I'm, I'm meeting people, you know, they got director of this and this person in Nashville, analytic, that, and I just gotta go meet everybody and have conversations. But it's similar to talking to the, the record store owner, the, the long ago to the DJ, to the program director, to the club promoter. It's just, it, it, to me, I hate to sound crazy, but you know, we used to write on graffiti walls and now you write on Facebook walls. We used to hand out flyers and now we got Instagram and, and Twitter. And to me, I just think it's a lot of the same, but it's more. You know what I mean? You just have to be, you know, hire the right people that's willing to take that journey with you. I, I agree. I think I, I said at the beginning that it's a lot of the same, um, the same uh, techniques just uh, done in a digital world where it's amplified to uh, the world uh, immediately, if you, if you get it right. Switching slightly here, because what I heard a lot of them say here, even though they didn't want to say it directly, is they're all doing what we always expected record labels to be doing. Um, it's a, there's some resources involved. People talked about maybe switching a partner um, people did switch partners at one point. Uh, John and I were involved in switching a primary strategic partner from a record company to a touring company. Um, there can be brand relationships that um, can provide the funding and you know, maybe getting you know, a national commercial for a brand if it feels authentic to your band is the same as getting played on every radio station in the country. Um, what's, you know, how, you know, is is that a question of integrity for the artist? Is it is it easier for a legacy artist, say, to be associated with a brand than an, uh, a young, um, you know, hip hop artist or EDM artist or, you know, culturally relevant singer songwriter out of Maine or something? I I think it depends. You know, as you said, I think it depends on if it feels authentic, if it feels like a good fit for the band. I think that they, you know, there was a period when brands got involved with music and did sponsorships and things that, that they got very little value out of and then there was a sort of decline in that and now I see a, a lot more brand involvement because they want to do experiences, it's more integrated, it's not just sort of sticking your name on a ticket or a, or a marquee and, and, and giving a check to somebody. I think more is required of an artist now. It's not just about meet and greets, it's about developing something a little bit more interesting. And as you develop that thing that's more interesting, it tends to feel more authentic. So, I mean, I think for any client, I mean, you know, we, get, we got offered recently, I mean, this is hideous, but, you know, Duran Duran to do something for Viagra. Well, I mean, that was horrible. We'll never do that. <laughs> but, you know, but if it's, but equally, you know, we've done, just done a deal with Aston Could Martin. Could be their core audience. Could, it probably is their core audience, but it's You hideous. asked how much. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, it wasn't enough. Um, so I think it I think it entirely depends on you know what kind of brands what what and what you're expected to do you know it's, but I think they're great partners. It's I a love tough brand one. I, you know, um, there was well, I grew up in an era where you know getting a check from a corporation was the kiss of death for any artist's authenticity. 
You know, that's why Bruce Springsteen never took a check from a corporation. Um, I remember the first big check that uh, Budweiser gave to Jay-Z John, um, a very famous rock star said to me like, you know, wow, you know, uh, if we took that check, our fans would say we sold out. Jay well, gets that check and they say he, he took Budweiser for that amount of money, so. Once uh, Bob Dylan did the Victoria's Secret commercial, <laughs> uh, to me it was like, it was, everything was fair game. Everything's fair game. Um, are we moving into a new period here, maybe, with, uh, you know, um, I'm going to jump to a different subject. Um, it's interesting because it's uh, the world we're living in right now. When the, uh, the inauguration of the person that got elected president of the United States was occurring recently, um, the people that were working with that um, committee were reaching out to all, everybody to try to get artists to play around that uh, event. And they were coming up short. No one, no one was going there, um, and including country artists who would lean maybe politically a little bit more to that side of the fence. And uh, one of the uh, um, heads of one of the big lobbying groups or the as trade associations that the music business is involved with, um, who was a former Republican lobbyist, because we seem to hire those people back during the Bush administration to, to represent us and was arguing with me about how we were really uh, losing an opportunity because there's things we need as an industry to get done legislatively with um, that the technology companies are, they're much more funded, they go, you know, and, and, and um, the, some of the battles between uh, the content owners in, in Google are around some of those legislative issues and they felt we were, you know, this person felt we were really blowing it by not engaging with the current administration. Um, I felt because, it, you know, the, the day after the administration there were events all over the, the country, all over the world, and there were artists, the biggest artists in the world, playing at all those events. I felt that, you know, we um, could not sell ourselves short by alienating our, con our constituency as, a, as an industry, as a, uh, a community. Uh, the, young, the young people who may not have been engaged as much in this election as they might, might have been, um, the disenfranchised groups, uh, people who care about climate change and everything, that there's a moment, being old, I grew up in, in, in a similar moment when music was the glue that held together an anti-war movement, a civil rights movement, a uh, women's rights movement. I mean, are we at that point now? Is, this some, is it a time for the artistic community, the managers, to engage in what's happening in, the, in this world and what's happening potentially in France and what's happening um, everywhere? And Kevin, I know you've been particularly politically involved uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, this current administration, I don't, I don't understand, so I'm not fucking with them like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's not the first time uh, we've been in a situation where we didn't have access. See, what, what happened, I'm not going to get too political, but what happened is we got so happy for eight years that we had access, that somebody listened, that uh, we were in the White House, when we got caught in the Situation Room, you know, playing around, it's like, we had so much pre unprecedented access. A lot of things didn't change in the music business because we had that access, but at least we had a seat at the table. Now you're talking about morals. You're talking about what I stand for. You're talking about my five-year-old daughter who wonders, like, you know, we thought Hillary was, we, everybody thought it was no way Hillary wasn't gonna win. We were drinking the Kool-Aid, you know what I mean? When Barack activated the African-American audience, Trump activated another audience and people just didn't get out and vote. And I tell people now, you see all these marches and things going on, where were they when Hillary was running? You know, and that, to me, we have to have a seat at the table, but I can't have a seat at the table with somebody who doesn't understand well, well, But morals. by the way, people would say that you had a seat at the table, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, the Obama administration did not do right by the music business. Mm -hmm. It did right by the tech companies. Mm -hmm. And we, don't have, we, we didn't have the money to lobby 
the way the tech companies, the telecommunications lobby has the money. Yeah, but the tech, co the tech companies change the landscape of the music business. So you can look at it, uh, whatever way you want to look at it, we, we, we increased 11% last year. You, know, you can say that he didn't have anything to do with it, but because of technology, the music business is growing again. So we, yeah, but we have a situation now where the last study I saw where YouTube the average, has a billion users, the average revenue per user at YouTube is $1.70 a year. Mm -hmm. The average revenue for a paid subscription, paid subscriber at $10 uh, a month is $70 a year. That's an incredible barrier here, and one could make an argument that YouTube is the real obstacle to full monetization of, of the music industry. The fans love it, artists, people the, use it. I, I, there is some research, recent research that's showing YouTube's starting to feel, I think, I think what will happen is it will fix itself. I, I think there will be less and less YouTube consumption and more and more subscription-based consumption. I, it's just a matter of people huh. now, I, it was a different thing, right? It was a place to go. You couldn't really stream music six years ago anywhere other than on YouTube. It was disguised as videos, but you were streaming music. So I, I think it's wrong, and I think there are some unfair things that are going on. We could, we could argue for that, and certainly there's, although it's a dying industry now, right, there's still the, the, the radio issues and whether we should be artists should be getting compensated for that, where they do in pretty much every other Western civilization country. But it's fixing itself. I, I think that part of it is fixing itself. I mean, it, it, I think a lot of managers and a lot of artists like YouTube from its promotional point of view, from its discovery point of view, but how can you fix the difference between a dollar seventy and seventy dollars? Um, Don't put you, your music on it. So you're talking about basically then going to war with uh, this platform that has a billion users. And, and if one person doesn't put their music on YouTube, does that matter? Does it, you know, if there's a solution that people that, you know, th there should be a win-win there, right? There should be a win-win for YouTube and the music industry if we can figure out how to work together to get towards but but we can't but the labels can't work together that's the problem and that's but the artists can right but 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 the labels own the artists masters for the most part and they and the, the artists can't say I, I you can't put me on YouTube the most in most record deals the labels gonna say yeah, I can do whatever I want with this I own it and the record labels can't talk to each other to figure out how to how to solve the problem Although they seem YouTube. to be solving it a little bit better with Spotify in particular. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that they don't, but I mean, they should all step up and take their music I off. agree with that. The, all, all the labels should just They're fighting Spotify on that. So they're threatening they, uh, to do one that One of the Spotify. reasons there, well, one thing, two things going on. I think the Spotify conversion numbers are really up now from the free tier. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden the label's going, wait a second, maybe this free tier is converting enough people and they're just ultimately interested in getting to 200 or 300 or 400 million paid subscribers, and it's happy days for everybody up here in the room and out on the streets. Um, I think it seems like the labels what would like to try to solve the YouTube issue, but they're worried about alienating their, their customers, um, who a lot of times live on YouTube and use it as the kind of it, modern day radio. But it's a message, it's a messaging thing. If, if the labels all went and pulled their music and said, you know what, we're pulling our music because this is a jobs issue. And our songwriters are losing their jobs because they're not getting paid. So the people who wrote your favorite songs are, are unemployed because they don't get paid enough. If that were messaged correctly and that the, the labels had the, had the sort of the guts to pull down the music, things would change. So I, but what bugs me out is this. We used to make videos. We paid for them and then we gave it to channels for free. We didn't make any money then, but we saw money come a different way. But we still made those videos and gave it to them. And then Viacom said, well, we should be paying a little bit for, for that. Radio, like John said, we'll go try to get our records on radio. We really don't get 
paid for what it should be like everywhere else in the world, but we were cool with it and it started to change, it started to change. Technology's still young in the music business and you have to allow the time. And but I'm not, I'm not saying, listen, so I, I know, you know, I, I, I want to go too much because I believe in uh, YouTube, I believe in Google as my partner. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but you what got I that on tape, right? Yeah, of course you got it. Yeah. But, but what, what, I, what I would say... It needs to go in the sizzle reel, too. What I would say, for the first time now, you have a real music person inside of the building. And that, that person has been charged with making it a place. You got a bunch of engineers who all they knew was, how do we get more people to look? And that would, now it's going to change into a music-friendly, a content creation-friendly place, but it will take time. That's the reality of it. Only I thing, agree uh, with only thing I, I want to point out, just one second here, and I know I'm not supposed to be talking this much, but the, um, the difference back is we used to be in a business where we used MTV to sell, to get people to buy physical units. Right now, the sale is the listen. Radio used to be something we used to promote people to buy a physical unit. Right now, the listen is the sale in a streaming world. So the consumption is the transaction. So it's being given away for peanuts over here, and we need to, we need to move over there. We're I, look at it, I just look at it different. I look at all these services as opportunities for us to get big, get big audience. The economics we have to work out. You just have to, and just think about it, an artist, um, and I don't know how, how Duran Duran promotes, but an artist that has a bass and has a touring, they get more out of touring because they know all the, well, the, the buried, bodies are buried and the parking and this and that and all this thing, whereas back in the day we didn't know anything about that. So it took time to get there. You know, I can't say YouTube is the biggest screen in the world. We might be getting pennies right now, but I have to believe that in years to come that it will be different. And we had a time where we did not support technology. We said, fuck technology. So why, didn't, why would technology not say, fuck us? That, that's a, oh, I can't curse. I'm sorry. But, but, right. You know. Well, like from, a, from a, philosoph like a philosophical standpoint, I agree with the idea that if there's a billion people there, I'm going to be there. Right? And we're going to be promoting those people because any big artist is going to have a lot of the majority of their revenue coming through touring. Right? So if the transaction is now touring, if someone's going to buy two tickets a year and those ticket sales are going to drive the amount of money you get from a festival, then I want as many of those billion people converted. And I think that the economics are going to have to figure themselves out. I've thought a lot about what John said with like radio doesn't pay us anything, right? So paying more than radio, it's a bigger audience than radio. It's a global audience. So I think in time it's going to have to change, but I've found a lot of success kind of dwelling in the shadow or whatever the big companies don't like and like trying to figure out how to work with them. And I do see them trying like they did hire Lior, they hired David Rappaport, who's a music guy too, from my opinion. And like, I think it will have to correct itself because I don't see it going away. I think anytime anything is trying to be shut down, it, it like when, on the threat of pulling music or shutting something down, things seemingly get fixed from a historical basis. And I understand that, but for larger independent artists, I see a lot of value in working with them. I feel like they're going to start rolling out their own playlisting and their own editorial strategy. And that'll really, like, what happens when an artist breaks? huge off of YouTube, right? Like truly like a brand new artist breaks off of YouTube, then I feel like it proves the, proves the point of its existence, right? And whatever you're gonna get on 30 million views or 20 million views, and I'm not even talking about a break, you know, superstar artists that are getting hundreds of millions of views on videos. If I get five or 10 or 15 million YouTube views, even if I'm not getting that much money, if those are starting to convert into, at that point in that artist's career, 25 and 30 and $35 tickets, there's no formula from YouTube back that's worth more than that. And I think that's where, as a manager, that's a way different conversation than a record label. If you're up here and it's a record label conversation, although they theoretically are participating in a lot of the ancillaries these days, that's a different conversation. For us, it's promotion. It's like why you would do a branding deal. It's like, hey, if you're going to give me $10 million worth of promotion and it's going to not be something that's alienating, but in fact may be converting fans, I'm, I'm, I might do that commercial for free, Yeah. let alone pay me. Hey, plus also, you have much more control. I mean, it, you, you know, with MTV it used to be, okay, can I get this video on? And you either did or you didn't. If they didn't want to play it, they didn't play it. 
but whereas at least with YouTube, you can control what you're putting out. You can you can put content out constantly. You can I mean I uh, you know with a with a band like Duran, you know we're not getting hundreds of millions of views, but it's a a medium that you know they've always been a very visual band, and it for me it's about selling tickets and T-shirts more than anything. Um, I mean, I, my frustration with YouTube is that it's not very transparent. It's very difficult to deal with them if you, you know, when you actually realize what you're not getting paid on, the second that somebody claims something in Germany, some video, it just goes into a pot, the, into a black hole, and nobody gets paid, supposedly. I, like, I find all that sort of stuff, and it's very hard to fix a lot of the things. Um, but I think it's an inevitability that we have to work with. So, I mean... The promotion, the marketing, the, 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 the uses of, there has to be a way to bridge these two things. And it seems to me that the, it's the managers in the artist community that are in always the 360 business to you know, lead this way. Because I do think they're headed down a, um, a lot of brinksmanship with the, with the labels right now who are getting or just looking at those numbers, and that, that, that study came from one of the major labels, and seeing a dollar seventy, seventy dollars, you know, we, if we can figure out how to, you know, message this the right way, we've got to go to war with them. And they're even saying we need the artists to make, to make, the, to make the message to the fans. But it sounds like you all feel that there is a lot of use for, from YouTube can you get a company like Google, which is either on any given day the biggest or second biggest company in the world, to change its DN its business DNA to come, you know, work with, can Lior do this? I mean, we know him, he's a great, he's powerful, he's determined, but can he overcome the, 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 you know, the, the business DNA of Google? Do, do we think though, when we talk about that, I mean, the reason that's $70 on a subscription is because someone's paying, right? $10 a month or $8 a month. Yeah. In theory, 50% or so of the advertising revenue across all of YouTube is going to the content owners, right? So a big part of the problem there is that the advertising dollars aren't matching what we perceive to be the value of our videos. Uh, supplemented by the fact that the advert the, on the free tier of Spotify, the number from ad, ad, the ad uh, revenue tier is much higher than what's coming through from YouTube. So it's got people's suspicions w up way high. But it's also a much smaller sample size, right? It's, it's a lot harder to monetize a, a view in Brazil than it is in... Supposedly. You know, so... I think that's part of it, and, and I think what has been, they've tried this and it hasn't really worked, is like to go to a YouTube subscription service, which nobody wants to do. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I, that's anecdotal, I, but it doesn't seem to me like there's a huge demand for people to start paying for YouTube. Well, what's also lost here is that the labels own Spotify, own parts of Spotify, pieces of Spotify. They, they don't own anything. And, of YouTube or Google, obviously. So the the, la the labels are in this in this game as well on Spotify. For, you know, so they they're always going to feed that to make that succeed because they're invested in it. And so it's easy to paint Google and and YouTube as the as the devil. Two, two of the three label groups uh, contend they're going to liquidate that equity. When that equity gets liquid, uh, they're going to distribute it to their artists according yeah, to their right. Right. <laughs> so, so they claim. Well, the, back to transparency. They, they might have to start paying the Spotify royalties first. Then, right. the, then we could get to that. Some, some of the cynicism built up over many years coming out here. Uh, great panel, great managers. Michael, Andrew, Kevin, John, Wendy. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you.